This is a special day, and I just uh, want to thank all of you for being here. It, uh, it means a lot to all of us, and to, uh, to Dr. Sharon Lord, it, um, let me tell you, getting to know this lady and giving, I'm going to give you some background because I, I, was, I was just blown away by her history. So I want you to, uh, to share with me in uh, telling her story, if that's okay. Do I have your permission? I always want to get permission. Well, except from the team. Um, it is an exciting time. And, um, you know, just, just uh, being here for the dedication of the locker room um, that Sharon agreed to, uh, to do for us. And it's people stepping up and people that make a difference. But you have to care first, and there's no doubt that she cares. It's important to have her name and plaque displayed on our locker room for our team and teams to follow. I told her that um, I want an awesome woman on the locker room so that our teams and our visitors know what is possible for women. There's a lot of powerful women in this room, so you understand how important it is. I want to be able to talk to our players about what she has done and why your accomplishments really matter. This awesome lady has broken more glass ceilings than you can imagine. And I had no idea, but I do want to share. And I know a lot of you already know these things. But let me tell you a little bit about her background. Sharon grew up in the mountains of southern West Virginia in the coal mining community where the Hatfield and McCoy's hillbillies view was actually waged. <laughs> now, I've never been a part of that now, Sharon, but I can only imagine. Her upbringing taught her the value of hard work, and her female role models demonstrated that women can do anything. She is a living example. She attended college by winning scholarships and working throughout her time as a student. Can you imagine? You're working and, and trying to do what you want to do and be the best. Dr. Lord left Indiana University to come to none other than the University of Tennessee as the first female professor of educational psychology in, in 1969 and she took on the rookie year of her career, challenged by the barriers of an academic male-dominated organization. Can you imagine? <laughs> During the time, what's that? <laughs> Absolutely. During the time, Sharon asked the physical education teachers if she could participate in PE classes for exercise. Who wants to volunteer for exercise? Well, she wanted to. She took horseback riding, volleyball, swimming, and dance. She was often the basis for much humor in the classes. That was when she learned that coaches of women's sports clubs were not paid, and that they had to raise their own funds. Been there and done that. Often through car washes and bake sales to travel. When she noticed that Stokely Athletic Center, brand new at the time, had only two changing rooms, one label, get this, women's PE faculty, and the other women's PE majors. She asked, where are all the other women supposed to change? Are only PE women supposed to exercise? Good question. She raised the greater question, what is your facilities here for women? Dr. Lord began to gain a reputation for her enthusiastic and, and just being so inspired about the teaching style. She was awarded the Outstanding Teaching Award at UT and her reputation as an advocate for equity spread throughout the community and the region. She engaged students in active, self-responsible learning, challenging them to take concerns and questions to the appropriate teachers and the administrators. In a conversation this year, Dr. Archie Dykes, chancellor at the time, recalled the meeting that Dr. Lord initiated with him. She wouldn't accept an explanation of status quo. 
not, we know that. It was only impossible to tell Sharon no. So we didn't tell Sharon no. The initiatives that she led in the early days of the cause of women remain a source of enormous pride to me and hopefully to all of you. In a larger dimension, I know that her pioneering work beyond academia has immeasurably enriched and profound and shaped the lives of countless numbers of men and women. We thank you for that. And our lives are better because she came our way. From 1970 through 73, Dr. Lord served as the chairperson of the newly found Women in Sports Committee. Her research led to the initial funding and formation of the UT Athletics Department. From bake sales, remember the bake sales, I remember the bake sales, to the program that we are today, which is absolutely amazing. When Dr. Lord left UT after an 11-year tenure, she was appointed by President Reagan as Manpower U.S. Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense with civilian rank of a three-star general. For her work in safety and occupational health and equal opportunity, she was awarded the prestigious Outstanding Public Service Medal by the Secretary of Defense, the first woman to be so honored. In 1995, as a trustee of the University of West Virginia Systems, Dr. Lord created a statewide booster organization promoting women in leadership, in sports, and throughout the state. When Dr. Lord served as the first female commissioner of human services in her home state of West Virginia, she once again created models which spread throughout the nation. Her initiatives were adopted as far away as Australia. Since 1979, through her international consultant business, Sharon Lord Associates, she advises military, business, and government leaders throughout the world, including New Zealand, Panama, and Europe. Sharon is a visionary change agent. In one of her awards, she described in this way, she is someone who knew what to do, and what is remarkable is she did it. Why is it important for Dr. Lord to name, have the naming of our locker room? I had to convince her, you know, women have to help women. No offense, guys, y'all can help too. So we'll welcome anything you want to do here. But, you know, she, um, she's a tenacious uh, risk taker. She has the courage to speak up. And I, I know what it means when women have courage to speak up. She has the constant determination not to give up. And that's what we try to teach our student athletes. Don't ever give up. Don't ever give up. She always has confidence and trust in herself and in the teams she creates. She has the ability to build relationships based on respect, and understanding. It is my indeed pleasure for Dr. Sharon Lord to come to the podium to speak today and just to say thank you for being a difference maker for all of us here. to tell you I had a new first for me yesterday. I tried to shop by myself in a shopping mall and I, God did not give me the gene in my DNA, the shopping gene. Pat Ball and all the people who love me can tell you I don't have a shopping gene. I almost had a nervous breakdown. It was all for you so I've been cool. <laughs> so you would know 
that at my age, life has just begun. So that you will know there are many chapters to your life. And I've written my remarks because my, they're timing me today. So I'm gonna get back to my remarks. But I really do thank you, every single one of you, who is so precious to me, who has chosen to spend this afternoon. Thank you. I feel such deep gratitude that you are here today. At this moment, I recall so clearly my hail and farewell party at the university in 1980. That was the only event in my entire life where I ran out of the room crying in the middle of my remarks. Do you remember that, Pat? I was bereft with ambivalence. On the one hand, I was exceedingly excited about the future. On the other, I realized I was leaving the first professional family, a true team comprised of so many of you from the university community and from the Knoxville community, and especially the students. And those students who are here, it just fills my heart to know you've traveled to be here. The graduate and undergraduate students were my true colleagues. There were a few others, like Dr. Charles Reynolds, who had some vision for the future. You were the team who challenged me to become more. You were the team who supported me on issues in the 60s and 70s that were not popular. And one of the things I'm gonna to say to you, the team, the Lady Vols, in the future, you may find you're gonna to have to make a choice between being popular and being respected. When you have an idea that the populace already understands, you know, that's fine. But when you have a unique idea, when you have a cutting edge idea, it's not always so popular. Stick by it, go for it. One day you will be respected. And they'll say, well, I didn't agree with her in the beginning, but I sure want to be on her side next time. Remember that, have the courage to do that. The students helped me create statewide conferences and national conferences, which brought hundreds of participants to Knoxville. And they got inspired and they took off and they made changes throughout the nation. We were a team, constituted of smaller teams within a larger team. And now they're part of an international team that developed through the years. We experienced many joys in the midst of the challenges and the resistance to social change that occurred. And one of the greatest joys was being a part of supporting the evolution of a girls basketball sports club as it grew into a powerful women's basketball team led by the most talented, dedicated, fierce coach in this nation. I've all I have told people around the world that my reward for the ridicule I endured in the early years was that Pat Head walked on campus in 1964 and she stayed. God is good. <laughs> coach Summit not only started her coaching career here, she stayed here so that she could ensure that for the rest of my adult life, I got to enjoy the fruits of her labor. After I left UT and was in my post in the Pentagon, which was very demanding, I was able to slip off to a women's basketball tournament in Scope Arena in Norfolk, and Pat provided me seats behind her bench. The crowds weren't so big then, and it was one of the first national TV games, and we lost. <laughs> I also returned from New Zealand to attend an NCAA tournament in Minneapolis, or I would fly into Knoxville to attend the World's Fair as the guest of the mayor, and they'd introduce me from the speaker, and I'd be busy talking and didn't hear them call my name, and Pat would have to punch me. Increasingly through the years, the arena was filled with fans. And on that occasion, and this is a side story I have to tell you about Dr. Earl Raymer, whom some of you will remember. When I took those results to the UT Athletic Board, and I thought I shouldn't be the one to have to present them, I was untenured, female, and under 30. I mean, you know, I was scared. 
But anyway, I presented the data and Dr. Earl Raymer, who was a very good man, who was president of the NCAA that year, looked at me and he says, well now, Sharon, honey, I understand what you're saying here, but surely you don't think folks will ever pay to see girls play ball. <laughs> so I took a deep breath the way I've learned to do, and I suggest you do. Don't pull your double barrel shotgun out <laughs> right away. Take a deep breath, and I composed myself, and I told them about this amendment to the Civil Rights Act that didn't have implemented regulations yet, so it wasn't real yet. And I told him it was going to be called Title IX and what was going to happen. Well, as the years went on, Earl Raymer did dump $20,000. 20000 baby. That was the sum. $20,000 into the women's physical education budget. And that's what began to pay um, Gloria Ray $400 to coach tennis and Pat to have travel money and so forth. Um, so when I returned on that occasion, at the guest of Dr. Ball and the mayor and others, um, Earl Raymer waved at me from the press bench and he motioned me down. He was retired. And I walked down and I hugged him and he waved his hand, Joe, and Pat around this arena that you all had filled up. And he says, Sharon, look at this crowd. And I said, yeah. He says, uh, you must be so proud. And I said, you know what, Earl? Every single one of these folks pay to see girls <laughs> play ball. <laughs> and he said, Sharon, you will never change, and I hope you never do. <laughs> it's a far cry from the handful of students, some of you who are here, whom are here, you used to carry your lunches over to watch Pat's practice and you received extra credit in my courses if you went to a Lady Balls game. <laughs> and in the early UT years, there was a very young, talented, brown-eyed, brown-haired, not particularly tall player who was my favorite, and I sure hope she's still in the room. I identified with her and I used to claim that if the world had been different when I was younger, I could have played basketball just like Holly Warlick. <laughs> when the local press would ask me questions about my future plans, I would jokingly reply, well, when I grow up, I just want to be Holly Warlick or Dolly Parton. <laughs> Holly, I tried to find a basketball you signed, which was presented to me at my going away party by Jean Wyrick, one of my best graduate students. And it was signed by Jean, it says, to my favorite role model from one of yours. And she had it signed by Holly Warlick. I couldn't find it, but I do treasure it. <laughs> <laughs> and Dr. Barbara Matthews, who is here from Florida today, presented me with an orange basketball jersey, which said across the front, Sissy Lord, and on the back it had one, one. However, it was spelled out underneath, W-O-N-O-N-E, -O -N -O -N -E, to signify that we had won one. Yeah. Um, I do treasure all those gifts, but now I want to call to our attention fully, and I want your attention fully, the Lady Balls team who are present today, and indeed, one of the deals was they had to be present today, or I wasn't going to be here. So I'm going to say to you, attention, <laughs> present self, you got it. Are you awake? I know you're tired. But this locker room dedication is for you, the Lady Balls. You are a living legacy. Now last night, Joan, I have to admit, I Googled. Joan can tell you that Pat and I swore one day in each other's presence we would never use email. We were not going to use the internet. And it took Joan a long time to get us to change our minds. <laughs> So I Googled last night the word legacy. <coughs> legacy. You are a part of a living legacy. 
Now, what it means is a gift handed down from a predecessor or predecessors from the past. And in the late 14th century, it said, a legacy was defined as an ambassador sent on a mission. In the case of the Lady Vols, indeed, there were early ambassadors sent on a mission. Dr. Nancy Lay, Helen Watson, Margaret Hudson, Joan Cronin, Pat Head Summit, Gloria Ray, Chancellor Archie Dykes, and Dr. Earl Raymer are just a few. They were ambassadors who created the framework, the bits and pieces that finally were put together in your program. And now the gift has been handed down to each of you. Right now, as Lady Ball's current players, you've received the gift of opportunity and support from the past. And as a part of a living legend, you are also a gift today. You are a gift to others. A gift which inspires courage and a gift which gives enjoyment to millions of others. Most importantly, and this is what I'm here to remind you, you are a gift for the future, for you will become soon a predecessor who passes down a legacy to others for the rest of your life. And I have something to tell you. One of the responsibilities that is carried by a role model who is part of a living legacy is that the assignment never ends. You don't get to resign from being part of a living legacy. You can't turn in your papers and say, okay, I no longer want to be known as a former Lady Vol, or the first female who headed aviation and ground safety in the Pentagon, or the winningest coach, male or female, in the nation. You just don't get to resign. You carry it. You carry the responsibility. You carry the legacy with you. And as the crowd cheers you on for your talent and your gift, grit and your determination today and tomorrow, when we're just going to really kill Georgia. <laughs> my sister's here from the University of Georgia, my brother-in-law and, and my nephew. Don't disappoint me. <laughs> As the crowd cheers from you, at the same moment you've been handled, handed a mantle of responsibility for the rest of your life. Sometimes it won't seem fair. Why can't I just be me now? You may say, I was a lady of all in the past. Remember, the legacy is living. You carry the past, you are the present, you create the future. You also carry the responsibility of giving back of representing forevermore all for which Lady Balls stand, quality, character, and leadership. I want to challenge you today, do me a favor, carry that responsibility wherever you go and whatever career you choose, because I know you're going to do great things. I wish I had some time to tell you some of the amazing, embarrassing, <coughs> amusing stories that occurred in my life. Some of you are already grinning. You were part of them. You won't be prepared for the things you're going to encounter. You just won't believe it. And I can tell you something else. I never in my life intended to be the first female anything. I had no desire to be the first female anything, and when I did end up that way, I tried very hard to hold the door open so that other women could rush right in there. The truth is, growing up in Hatfield-McCoy country, I just wanted to lead and maybe be the president or a cabinet member or a senator or a professor who wrote books or a writer or a farmer like my granny. I held so many different visions for my life along the way. But I do urge you to always have a vision for your life. Imagine achieving what you'd like to achieve or something better. I would always say, okay, I want to be Dolly Parton when I grow up, or something better. You have to allow for the something better because life will close a door on you at times, 
and it won't be fair. <coughs> and at other times, a big door will open up that you can't believe, and you're going to have to take a deep breath and have the courage to step through the door and know that it's okay to make mistakes because that's the way you learn to do things right. Also, don't be afraid to ask stupid questions. Asking stupid questions is what most people won't do, and that's why they don't leap ahead. You've got to ask the questions to get the answers. So, in closing, I want to just give you a few little tips. First of all, keep your sense of humor. When it comes to uh, mistakes, I'll tell you one of my best ones. I didn't grow up on a farm. I didn't know much about farming, but I wanted to have a farm. So I bought some land here while I was a professor, and I wanted to have lots of animals, but I wanted to have hens, you know, I wanted to have chickens and have fresh eggs. So I rushed off in my old white truck with, in my blue jeans with my bubble gum in my mouth and my country music on the radio. I had about one day a month that I had time to do that, and I went over to the farmer's co-op, and I pushed my way to the front because the guy was ignoring me because I was a girl. And uh, I said, I want some chickens. And he says, uh, how many? And I said, oh, 12 hens and 12 roosters. <laughs> it didn't occur to me they didn't come in pairs. I didn't have time to think about it. <laughs> this is true. Along the way, and my Rhode Island red hens had the biggest, healthiest brown eggs with two or three yolks in them. And, and uh, one day I went outside and I noticed all my hen's hair was falling out on the top. That's what I called it when I called the farmer next door and said, you know, there's a dead hen in my yard. I think there's something wrong with my hens. So J.D. comes up on his tractor with a big chew of tobacco in his mouth and a looks at this hen and he hears a cacophony of rooster crowing. I mean, rooster is like crazy. And he looked at the hen with the hair pulled out and he looked at the dead rooster and he turned his head and spit tobacco up on the hillside and I know that's because he didn't want to laugh in my face. And he turned back around and he says, uh, Sharon, how many hens you got? I said, 12. He says, how many roosters you got? I proudly said, 12. He said, uh, well, Sharon, get rid of 11 of them roosters. Your hens is dying of exhaustion. <laughs> true, it's true. I made mistakes like that all along the way. You know, you just pick it up and you learn from it. My brother-in-law, who's present, took 11 of those roosters, killed them, and as I recall, boiled them and put them in jars. Isn't that right, Richard? Yes, yes. And my hens lived happily ever after. <laughs> so the next tip, it really, is keep your sense of humor. Allow yourself to make mistakes and keep your sense of humor. Colonel Hamrick, who's here, who was my military assistant in the Pentagon, who was our OTC director right back here, he saluted me when, uh, when I walked in today. Anyway, I drafted him. I only got to pick one staff member in the Pentagon. I inherited everybody else, civilian and military. I called him from the field. He hadn't been through staff school. I could have destroyed the man's career. But anyway, we all survived and he got promoted. And I remember one particular day. It was a really stressful day. I'd had to testify on the Hill in the company of some generals who did not support the policy position I'd convinced the secretary to hold. In the black car we were driving in up to the Hill, it was stressful. And then I came back from the Hill. Major Hamrick at the time rushes out with my clothes and my briefcase and the helicopter lands in the Pentagon uh, landing spot, whatever that's called. and. Uh, <laughs> And I got saluted on to the helicopter, and I thought at that moment, wow, I wish my mama could see me now. <laughs> but I got there. I was tired. It was the U.S. Army War College, and this big car is waiting for me with a three-star license plate. And I knew that was for me because I was the only one on the helicopter. So the dudes who were flying the helicopter salute me off of the helicopter. Tired me, 
walks toward the car, and this old guy, the driver, says, honey, I'm looking for a three-star. Do you know where he might be? It's one of those times I took a big, deep breath. And I said, well, I hate to be the one to deliver the bad news, but you're looking at him. <laughs> and he said, oh, ma'am, are you going to report me? And I said, not if you promise me that in the future, when a woman steps off a helicopter, you're just going to assume she's a three-star general. There are all kinds of ways to teach lessons. You need your double barrel shotgun some days, but try other ways first. So the last thing I'd like to say to you is don't forget to celebrate the achievement of others. Do you know when you replace jealousy with celebrating other people's accomplishment, it means you get to celebrate all the time? And in doing so, express your gratitude to the people who supported you and realize, well, you, you wrote me some notes. Do you remember that? Did you happen to know who you were writing them to? <laughs> or did you just write out a little note because the coach says, women, women, there's a woman who's done something, write her a note. Okay. I can tell you there were a few of you who just wrote me a note. And that's okay, you probably were busy, but I'm gonna tell you that gratitude is one of the most joyful things you can carry in your life and one of the most joyful things you can give to people because I remember and will for the rest of my life remember one note and that note was from a player who thanked me and she said she hoped someday she might be a doctor and then she placed a little heart beside her signature. Now I wear this heart. This heart and other hearts have been given to me by someone who keeps reminding me that at the end of a life, we may not, as we're dying, we may not uh, lie in bed and think about our achievements or our money or how famous we were or our status. I've helped a lot of people make the transition to the other side of life in this past decade, and I can tell you, they lie in bed and they ask the question, how well did I love? How well did I love? And I'm gonna urge you to realize that when you put your heart into notes, into gratitude, into appreciation, you're putting your spirit into it. Spirit, inspire. To inspire means to breathe spirit into whatever you do. That's how you inspire people. Pat Summit has her heart in what she does. Joan Cronin has created an incomparable Lady Balls program across all sports. Choose things that tap your heart. You know, I honor you today. I honor you, and I hope you will carry that legacy. You are my inspiration. You are the inspiration to so many, and you will be for the rest of your life. Thank you. Thank you.